Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Interurban Dialogue. Thank you very much for uh, braving this weather, uh, Friday before the holidays, uh, to uh, join us this morning. Uh, the Dialogue is thrilled and, and honored to partner uh, in this session with, uh, with IDEA and IFAS to launch the second edition of IDEA's flagship publication, the Global State of Democracy 2019 Report, Addressing the Ills, Reviving the Promise. The report couldn't come at a better time. Many of us are perplexed and disturbed by what appears to be what Larry Diamond has called a democratic recession throughout the world. Certainly in Latin America, we are confused and surprised about this moment of tremendous turbulence and unrest. Political parties and leaders have little credibility in many countries. And the street is becoming the locus of political contestation and the channeling of citizens' discontent and demands. The case of Chile, which, is, which exploded less than two months ago, is especially dramatic. It caught every, virtually everyone off guard. Chile had been regarded <coughs> as the region's model of social peace and political stability, backed by a strong economy. Yet now there is a Chile before October 18th and another Chile after October 18th. As our good friend Enrique Iglesias has said, no es una época de cambio, sino cambio de época. This is not a time of change, it's a change of an era. What is very special and meaningful about today's event is the opportunity to put Latin America in a global context to get some necessary perspective. Dialogue itself, as an organization, is focused more and more of its work on global trends and how they impact Latin America. Our Asia Latin America, our Asia Latin America program, with a special emphasis on China's engagement in the region, is a clear example. As is our energy program that carefully tracks global energy markets. <clears throat> this is a very valuable, judicious report. Combines a sound conceptual framework very interesting findings, and very thoughtful recommendations. As a Latin Americanist, at a moment of some confusion and despair, it's instructive and reassuring uh, to see what is included under the heading in this report of, quote, encouraging. Admittedly, many of us who work on the region too often overlook some of the advances in democracy that become clear when put in proper comparative framework. I want to call to your attention to a dialogue report that just was released this week, which fits with very closely with the focus of today's session. Uh, it's a report of a, a symposium series uh, in partnership with the Inter-American Development Bank called Anti-Corruption, Transparency, and Integrity in, in the Americas. Um, these are the results of discussions and papers during a, ser uh, a series from, May, from February to May of, of this year. This is the rule of law program directed by Michael Camilleri here at the Dialogue. The format of today's session is um, that following uh, my remarks, we'll hear from uh, Tony Banbury, who is the president uh, of IFAS, and we're also from IFAS. We're extremely pleased to have Michael Fretlick, um, who is uh, the vice president for programs, who has kindly agreed to moderate this discussion. Uh, it's a special joy for me uh, to welcome uh, Kevin Casas, uh, the Secretary General of IDEA. Um, he's been in his post, what, how many months? Something, four, four months. Four too many. <laughs> four months, uh, and has done, uh, not surprisingly, has done uh, extraordinary work with a very, very important institution. Uh, Kevin um, was the first director of our rule of law program here at the Dialogue. Uh, and fortunately, he remains a senior fellow, so we haven't, uh, he's still very much engaged uh, in the dialogues, thinking, and, and our work. Uh, Kevin, as you know, was a um, former vice president of Costa Rica. He also led political affairs at um, the Organization of American States, and he worked at the Brookings Institution as well on the Latin American Initiative. Um, Kevin's a great friend, so bienvenido a tu casa. Welcome. And congratulations on a great report. 
Um, I, we could have two better discussions for today's uh, event. They will get a proper introduction uh, by Michael later on, but I just want to thank uh, Tom Crothers, who, uh, whose knowledge uh, of uh, global uh, democracy, I think, has no peer at all. There's nobody that comes close to Tom in terms of his understanding and knowledge and tracking of what's happening globally in the area of democracy. And uh, Roberta Jacobson, who has a very profound understanding uh, of the region, uh, and uh, she is also, I don't know if this is part of your introduction, but I want to make sure people know she's a member of the Inter-American <coughs> Dialogue, so she's my boss. And, um, anyway, thank you all for coming, and again, I'm sure this is going to be a very stimulating and uh, productive discussion. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Tony Banbury, uh, and I'm the president of ISIS. Uh, thank you, Michael Shifter and the American Dialogue for hosting this event. I think everyone recognizes the great contributions that the Inter-American Dialogue makes to the policy community in Washington and well beyond, and the regard that everyone has for their, their work and their convenience. So thank you very much for that. I am extremely pleased to be here today with uh, my new friend and my colleague, uh, Kevin. The work that IDEA does around the world on democracy promotion and, and protection uh, is uh, so important, such, makes such an important contribution to what we are all committed to and inspiring, and aspiring to. And, the opportunity now for IDEA and IFAS to work even more together uh, as we are committed to in the months ahead gives me great excitement and optimism. Uh, the, the report that is going to be discussed today, The Global State of Democracy, uh, I think, it, for those of you who haven't read it yet, I really commend it to you. It makes uh, a, a fantastic contribution to the, the field uh, at a very particular moment. Uh, I think the quote that uh, Michael uh, read uh, it is uh, particularly poignant. It, talks, uh, it really addresses how uh, much of a moment this is now, what a shift uh, we are uh, in the midst of in the field of um, democracy around the world and certainly the, the protection uh, and advancement of democracy. One of the great things about the report is the, all, all the positive uh, aspects of uh, democracy that it addresses and, and provides great analysis and, and detail on. It's not all depressing. There's a lot of things that are depressing, but the report has a lot to encourage us and, uh, and inspire us moving ahead. Um, but clearly, there is tremendous backsliding in democracy and rising authoritarianism. Uh, the sense that pervaded this field following the end of the Cold War that the march of democracy was somehow inexorable, uh, maybe a bumpy and windy road, but nonetheless always forward, um, that sense is gone now. There is, uh, there, there are very serious cases, not just of backsliding, but countries, as the report points out, that have moved from democracy back into an authoritarian camp uh, not only are we forced to confront all the old challenges uh, to democracy, ballot stuffing and whatnot, uh, and, and the important for an organization like Dykes or IDEA, the importance of getting the mechanics of elections right, but now there are much greater, more severe and pervasive threats to democracy. Uh, so we have to continue doing all the old work and take on much more, uh, much new work with, with much greater challenges to confront these threats to uh, democracy, whether it's uh, malign foreign actors or malign domestic actors who are capturing democracy through democratic uh, methods and then using uh, the, the tools of democratic governance to undermine state institutions and, and democracy, or the use of technology and the weaponization of technology. So these are uh, very serious threats. They fill the, uh, the democracy community with anxiety. I know uh, certainly when I travel around the world and talk with partners in countries where IFAS is working, um, electoral management bodies or anti-corruption authorities or 
uh, electoral tribunals. Uh, our partners are filled with uh, anxiety, concern, questions, and a desire for more help. How can you help us confront these? And we as an organization uh, need to have good answers to that. Um, they're not easy answers, there are obviously no magic bullets, but it's not enough just to say these problems are, are difficult. Uh, we have to be uh, very innovative in developing new programmatic tools to uh, protect and advance democracy. That's a, a, a very important responsibility for an actor like Ifis, and I'm sure that Kevin shares that sense of responsibility. This past year, in recognition of that and drawing heavily from the work of people like Tom Carruthers, uh, I wish we had this report earlier because it would have helped us as well. Um, IFAS went through a new strategic planning process and we dramatically changed our mission. And uh, quite simply, our new mission is together we build democracies that deliver for all. And uh, that short mission statement uh, reflects very much the findings of this report. And in some respect, perhaps the most important word in that new mission statement is together. Um, we need to work together to confront these problems. It's no longer possible to work in um, our own narrow lanes, given the, the, the serious and pervasive and new threats to democracy. And I'm extremely pleased that uh, Kevin and myself and IDEA and IFAS are committed uh, to uh, building out the great partnership we have. We've been working together as institutions for a long time, forming ACE, uh, an electoral knowledge network and bridge, training, uh, and so there's a great foundation, but I, I look forward to doing much more together. Uh, so if, if we're going to succeed in confronting these uh, challenges, we have to understand them as best as possible and develop great policy responses to them. And I think this report and the dialogue uh, that uh, Michael and his team are hosting here is an important opportunity for him then, uh, for us to do that. So I will now turn it over to my colleague, Michael, to uh, watch us into what I'm sure will be a really great conversation. Well, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Michael. And thank you for uh, hosting the interrupting dialogue for hosting this event. I'm very pleased to serve as a moderator. We're going to begin. I think everyone is very interested to hear more about the, the uh, Global State of Democracy Report, the second uh, such report that International Ideas has released over the past few years. Uh, so we'll turn to Kevin now for a presentation uh, and then look forward to dialogue. Uh, we'll have two discussants, as has been mentioned, uh, for Dr. remarks, and then open things up again. Over to you. Well, thank you so much uh, for being with us uh, today. I mean, this is a, a you know, this feels like homecoming. For me, I mean, to be uh, amongst so many old friends and, and new friends, well, it's, uh, it's wonderful. And I'm, I'm particularly pleased to see that, uh, and I say this personally, but I guess it also concerns the national idea. I mean, I'm very pleased to see that we are partnering with truly two of, the, of my favorite organizations in, in the world. A, that, you know, and, and here there's a personal note, you know, both the dialogue and, uh, and IFAS have played a very important role in my career. So I'm, I'm very happy to see that uh, we're coming together today. And it's also great to be with uh, all friends as well, Roberta and, and, and Tom, and luminaries in their own right. A, be providing commentary today. Um, perhaps, you know, for those of you that are not so uh, familiar with uh, international idea, I, I, it would be good to say a word about what international idea is and what it does. 
The International IDEA is, is an intergovernmental organization with 33 member states. Uh, just last week, uh, the Council of Member States of IDEA uh, approved the accession of our latest uh, member, uh, that's Tunisia, which is obviously, uh, uh, you know, we're very pleased about this for all sorts of political and symbolic reasons. Uh, so we have 33 member states from all regions of the world whose mission uh, is supporting and advancing democracy worldwide. And IDEA does that in, a, a, in several different ways, but it, two of them are, are particularly crucial. I mean, it, it, IDEA is a peculiar institution in the sense that on the one hand, it's a, a, it's a kind of, of think tank a, that produces high quality, evidence-based comparative knowledge on electoral systems, political reform, a constitutional design, gender equality in politics, and democratic governance writ large. And it's also, on the other hand, a provider of technical assistance on the ground, okay, working on those same issues and currently involved in different, in different ways in over 70, 70 countries. So we produce knowledge, but we also try to bring that knowledge to bear on, on the ground. So we, we pride ourselves in in, uh, in calling IDEA a think and do tank. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess international IDEA embodies the notion that the struggle to advance democracy should not be a solitary endeavor, even though there's value in producing, uh, in systematizing a comparative knowledge and experience about democratic processes and facilitate that knowledge to those that are on the trenches building the democracy. Um, and it's uh, on that location to produce knowledge which is policy relevant, uh, where our global state of democracy initiative is, is found. Um, this is a project that started out in 2016 with the support of the, of the Swedish government, the financial support of the Swedish government. And <coughs> which already yielded one report published in 2017. Uh, we now, you know, we're putting in your hands the second iteration of, of, this, of this effort. Uh, and we expect to continue this uh, and to turn this into really one of our truly crucial knowledge products uh, going, going forward. Uh, <coughs> The report that we are launching uh, here in DC today, it really covers a lot of ground. I mean, it's a, the, the scope of the information. I mean, there's one thing of value in the report is that the, the sheer amount of data that uh, has gone into the, into the analysis. Um, we, we base the analysis in, uh, in 97 variables political performance where 158 countries going back to 1975, year after year, until 2018. So it's really a, a significant amount of data. A lot of this data, it should be acknowledged, comes uh, through a collaboration, a close collaboration with the Varieties of Democracy Institute at the uh, University of Gothenburg. Uh, they're truly one of the leading mm -hmm. partners of this effort. Their contribution should be to be acknowledged, and, and the other thing that uh, it's worth uh, noting about the report is that it, it also fills, uh, it tries to fill at any rate, a knowledge gap in the sense that the data that we have allows for a very uh, timely uh, tracking of progress in the achievement of uh, a few of the sustainable development goals particularly uh, SDG 16 on uh, peace and strong institutions. Peace, justice, and strong institutions. It, it is currently the only report, it's a, it's a unique project in, in a way, because it's, it's the only 
report on the lowest state of democracy that any intergovernmental organization produces. Uh, so I guess neither the World Bank nor DPA nor UNESCO produces a similar report, only little international idea and with very limited resources, which is no you know, small achievement, I think. Uh, and as, as Tony was um, mentioning in his remarks, and uh, I, I, I couldn't agree more, I think there's a need, and we try to cater to that need, there's a need to shift the debate a little bit from the current funk about democracy to a more nuanced discussion, which on the one hand uh, acknowledges the very significant challenges that democracy is facing, arguably the, the stiffest challenges since the 1930s, but also recognizes that there's a lot of good things, there are a lot of good things happening out there in terms of democracy. So it's not all, all lost. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and in a way, we have to abandon the hand wringing and the, and the uh, constant anxiety about the state of democracy have a more nuanced discussion based on facts. That's, uh, that's the main thing. Last but not least, uh, I also uh, would like to um, reiterate that one of the points made by, by Tony in his remarks, which is that it is truly important at this point in time, I mean, given the challenges that the international idea and I list and all the bodies that do similar work in the world really come together. And, uh, and that, in, in a way, given the challenges that we have, it, to some extent, it's been uh, brought upon us the task of, of playing defense of democracy. You know, we, we, there are times when you can play offense, but we have to play defense now. And part of the, of the trick of playing defense is really building a network of organizations that are able uh, to come together rather than uh, being competing all the time for scarce resources, that we come together uh, to build that network able to protect them all. So anyway, I mean, that's my way of a, a long-winded introduction uh, uh, to the report that uh, Got us here. So now I'm gonna I'm gonna do two things. I mean I'm gonna I'm gonna talk a little bit about a, about the global findings of the of the report, uh, and then you know in the second part uh, I'm gonna talk about some of the findings for for Latin America, and inevitably given the sheer amount of data I, I'm going to cherry pick. You know I'm I'm going to select some of the main themes that come, uh, that sort of jump from the, from the page uh, when, you, when you read the report. I very much encourage you to read the report, and if not the whole report, there's a, there's a summary, and there are regional chapters uh, that may be of your interest. Certainly the, the Latin American chapter is a, is, a, is a very interesting one. So, well, it, it, there you go. I mean, that's the, the structure of the report. I mean, there's a global, there's a global chapter, and then it's divided up in, uh, in four regional chapters for Africa and the Middle East, Asia Pacific, the Americas. By the way, I mean, the, the, the chapter on the Americas it, it goes beyond Latin America. And actually, it, I think it's an interesting contribution that the, the report sort of uh, zeroes in the state of democracy in North America. And, uh, and I have to say that there are very interesting findings when it comes to the, to the way democratic indicators are, are trending in, the, in this country. <clears throat> and then Europe. So this is the, the, basic, the basic structure. Now, um, if this is all based on a on a conceptual framework that that builds upon the basic um, the basic concept of, of democracy that uh, that we use at IDEA, which is uh, based on two broad principles: 
uh, namely popular control over decision making and political equality in the exercise of that control. These principles have then, you know, have, have been translated into five core attributes of democracy, which are the large circles that you see that you see here. Uh, namely, representative government, which focuses on free and fair elections and free political parties, roughly. Fundamental rights in formal and formal checks on government, the whole issue of checks and balances. Uh, impartial administration, which crucially includes the, the issue of corruption and how countries are able or not able to deal with corruption. And finally, participatory engagement, which focuses on citizen participation through civil society engagement and national and local elections. And each attribute is assigned a score from zero to one on the basis of a lot of different sources. And as I said, I mean, the INSIS they cover 180, 158 countries from 1975 until 2018, and they are updated yearly. And one of the things that the current report does, which the first one uh, didn't do, is that for the first time we develop a political regime classification. Uh, and we have identified three broad regime types, democracies, hybrid regimes, and non-democracies. And an important thing to bear in mind is that on the basis of those five big attributes, it, when you graphically represent the scores of the countries, it, you cannot avoid the, you cannot avoid the conclusion that democracy comes in many shapes and forms. Uh, and this is very important from the, the policy making standpoint. Actually, there are only 21 countries in the world that score highly across the five attributes. Below that category, this thing is a, is a, is a cal uh, kaleidoscope. 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 Uh, and, and there are all sorts of different combinations uh, of countries. I mean, in this in this heat map, as, as we call it, uh, the green represents uh, high scores, the yellow represents uh, mid-range scores, and the red represents low scores. As you can see, there are all sorts of different combinations. Actually, there's another big cluster of countries that scores in the mid-range performance across the board. So it, this is important because uh, there's no such a thing as one size fits all when you, if you want to be effective when it comes to democratic assistance. Uh, you know, all the countries have different stories to tell when it comes to the performance of their uh, democratic indicators. Um, now, some key findings. And I start with the global findings. First, encouraging development, because as I said, you know, we want to uh, have a more balanced discussion about democracies, and, uh, about the state of democracy, and, uh, and there's, you know, a, a significant amount of uh, good things happening out there, which deserve to be encouraged. And further, if the first and our Probably the most obvious one is that, uh, you know, I, I always found the talk about democratic recession a, a little bit suspect. Um, you know, I can understand where the, the term comes from, but actually, when you when you look at the, the data, uh, democracy keeps advancing in the world. There there, there are more and more democracies uh, worthy of the name in the in the world. Uh, in 1975, one fourth of countries were democracy. Now is the case for more than half the countries, which is the, the green line that you see. Uh, the number of democracies has uh, tripled in the last four decades, and now more than half of the world's population and more than four billion people live in democracies. In 75, more than half of all countries were non-democracies. Now, these regimes represent less than a quarter, which is the, the red line. 
And, and it's very clear, however, that the advance of democracy is not at the same pace as it, uh, a, as it happened after 1975, and particularly after the fall of the Berlin Wall. But it, it, nonetheless, whereas in 2008, we had 90 democracies, <clears throat> by 2018, the number had increased to 97. And part of the reason why it has increased is that democracies keep popping up, and not just popping up, I mean, there are they're, they're, they're popular struggles behind this. I mean, democracies keep uh, coming forth uh, in places that were inhospitable democracy before. So for instance, in 2015, uh, Burkina Faso, which had been in a hybrid regime for, for a long time, transitioned to democracy. Myanmar as well, which had been under military rule for decades, had its first free and fair elections. And also in places like Malaysia and Armenia, more recently, that uh, you know had been a hybrid, I mean, some of the most persistent hybrid regimes in the world. And we can also mention a very encouraging democratic uh, happenings in places like Gambia, like Sudan, more, most recently, uh, Ethiopia. So good things are, are happening in rather unlikely places. The other interesting thing is that democracy has, on the whole, proven very resilient. Uh, our report defines resilience as the ability to uh, the, the ability of a democracy to remain as a democracy. And uh, if you take all the democracies that were born either before 1975 or since, 81 percent uh, have been democracies uninterruptedly since 1975 or or before or since they transitioned to democracy. Um, which is very important because on the whole, once a country crosses a certain threshold of democratic performance, which you can label as democratic, they tend to stay there. Uh, and this is, this is really, really crucial. So there's value in pushing for democracy. And there's value that goes beyond the, the, the beyond the moment. I mean, this tends to stay into the future. The fourth and crucial finding, and this is connected to the, to the SDGs, is that democracy provides better conditions for sustainable development than hybrid regimes and non-democracies. And, and it is important to pass this through the test of reality. I mean, there's a lot of rhetoric around SDGs that claims that this to be the case. Well, our data, I mean, to some extent, confirm this. Um, when you take uh, things which are very important, like like gender equality, or 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 even corruption, where democracies get seem to get a bad rap. Well, the fact of the matter is that when you average out the 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 evidence, a uh, when it comes to gender equality, non-democracies and hybrid regimes tend to do much worse than democracies when it comes to gender equality. Uh, and even in the case of corruption, democracies tend to do much better in terms of their corruption levels than hybrid regimes and non-democracies, which stands to reason. But it is important to, uh, to have the evidence to back it up. Um, the, the finding of, about corruption is particularly important because uh, in our data, corruption appears, the prevalence of corruption, or conversely, the absence of corruption, uh, has been found uh, among all the elements of our framework, the one that is most highly correlated to human development, the prevalence of corruption. Um, so the fact that democracies do better when it comes to this is a strong indicator that then they tend to do better in, 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 the, in terms of achieving sustainable development. So this is all good 
and positive. Now, uh, uh, you know, as, as we know, uh, it, it's not all hunky-dory. And there are very severe challenges. The, the first one, and arguably uh, the most important one uh, that we find is that while the quantity of democracy continues uh, of democracies continues to increase, the quality of democracy is decreasing in a very visible way. Um, Twenty percent of democracies were considered weak, and by weak we mean that at least one of the five attributes uh, score uh, it, it gets a low score, gets a red. Uh, the twenty percent of democracies were weak in 2008, that has increased to 25%. And then the proportion of democracies that score highly in all attributes have plummet, has plummeted from nearly half uh, in 1975 to just above a fifth today. Uh, and those weak democracies are all over the world, uh, a lot of them are, are in Africa, but also they can be found in Asia and Pacific, Latin America, and even Europe. And this erosion of democracy, I mean, the quality of democracy comes in different, in different shapes and in different intensities. The, the, the most serious um, type of weakening of democracy is what we call democratic backsliding. It, the democratic backsliding is a, that case that involves a gradual and generally intentional weakening on checks on government and civil liberties, often by democratically elected uh, authorities, which takes steps to undermine democratic principles uh, especially control mechanisms and civil liberties uh, with democratic instruments. It, the cases in which democracy is subverted from the inside, as it were, and we can think of many cases <clears throat> uh, of this type. And what we see here is a list of cases where this is happening in, in quantifiable ways. Uh, one of the remarkable things about this list is uh, and again, I mean, there are different intensities to this. There are the cases where you have democratic backsliding, and then there are the cases where democratic backsliding leads a political regime to, to stop being a democracy and start being a hybrid regime, or eventually an authoritarian regime. Among the serious cases of backsliding, it's worth noting, it's worth noting that six of, six of them are to be found in Europe including uh, members of the European Union. Which goes to say, and this is an important point in this discussion, goes to say that, you know, that old notion that we had that, you know, weak democracies were an issue of, uh, you know, the young and fledgling democracies, poor democracies, is no longer true. I mean, the challenges that we're seeing are truly global in nature. And, and, and affect all sorts of political regimes. Interestingly, in this table, we find the, the cases of Nicaragua uh, recently, which uh, regressed from being a democratic political system uh, to being a hybrid regime today. Even more serious, and we're going to talk about that uh, later in the presentation, is the case of Venezuela, which is the one case in the world that has regressed from being a democracy with high levels of representative government as recently as 20 years ago to being an authoritarian, a full-fledged authoritarian regime. It's the, it's the one case in the world that regression through all the phases has taken place. Also, about the quality, a declining quality of democracy, and this is important, if we find that shrinking space, in civic spaces are shrinking all over the world. 
And by, by shrinking of civic space, it, we, measure, we measure this through the, the performance in terms of civil liberties, uh, media integrity, and civil society participation. And the number of countries where declines in civic space uh, is taking place has more than quadrupled over the past decade alone. Um, and also the cases where uh, media integrity has deteriorated visibly. It, this, is a, this is a real concern. I mean, and, and the, the, the shrinking of civic, of civic space uh, has taken several forms, including changes to legislative and regulatory frameworks, funding cuts to NGOs, and laws that regulate public protest and online, online engagement. The, the second big negative finding is that hybridity has increased dramatically over the past uh, four decades. I mean, the number of hybrid regimes has exploded. And it's important to understand that hybridity is not a transitional stage. In many cases, it's a, it's a, it's a permanent condition. I mean, countries get stuck there. And, and many of the countries that are stuck there have never experienced democracy. Um, it's the, the case that the cases that combine a democratic facade with undemocratic features, such as uncompetitive elections and restrictions on civil, on civil liberties. A, and hybrid regimes are found in all regions except North America. Now, the third cluster of findings of a negative kind is the insufficient progress that has been made in three areas. And this is I would think one of the most striking findings of the, of the report. I mean, uh, first of all, in nearly half the countries in the world perform badly when it comes to levels of corruption. But what is most striking is that the proportion of countries that do badly when it comes to corruption has not changed one bit in 45 years, uh, which is quite remarkable. I mean, that, I guess, goes to say uh, uh, that Dealing, with dealing successfully with corruption is an exceedingly complicated issue. Uh, you know, so beware when typically populist leaders of, the, of our time and age, you know, come forward saying that they have a magic wand that they will use uh, through the sheer force of their personality and their ethics uh, to change the levels of corruption in their country. It doesn't work that way. And that's what this shows. A, a similar finding concerns uh, gender equality. I mean, there has been real progress, but it's, it's very slow. I mean, to this day, only 24% of, member, of members of uh, parliaments in the world are, uh, are women. And at the current pace, maybe my, let me see, my great-granddaughter may be able to live in a world where half of the seats in national legislatures are occupied by women. So uh, this is clearly uh, bad news, and it's clearly unacceptable. There's also insufficient progress when it comes to judicial uh, independence. That had, you know, levels of judicial independence have barely, barely moved upwards uh, over the past 40, 45 years. And over a third of countries have low levels of judicial uh, independence, as shown here in the, in the red uh, line. And actually, since 2013, the number of countries with significant declines in judicial independence outnumbered those with advanced. So that's, I mean, that gives you a flavor of some of the global findings. Now I'm going to say a few things about, about Latin America, and I'm going to organize the findings in a similar way. Uh, there are encouraging developments. Uh, if you see this map, uh, Latin America is the region in the world where democracy has advanced the most over the past 40 years. This used to be the world in 1976, red being non-democracies, yellow being hybrid regimes, and green being democracy. And there's very little green to show. There was very little green to show. The world has changed dramatically. 
but it has changed the most <coughs> in the Western Hemisphere. So th th this is clearly this is clearly uh, good news. Uh, alongside Eastern Europe, Latin America is the region where democracy has uh, has made the the, the, the greatest uh, advance over the past uh, four and a half decades. Number two, another piece of good news. In the component of representative government, Latin America tends to do uh, rather well. It, it, not just in general, but also when you take the top five countries in the world in terms of their performance when it comes to representative government, three of them, Costa Rica, Chile, and Uruguay, and I'm very proud that Costa Rica is, you know, the top of the table. Uh, it do very well. I mean, are among the top five countries in the world. So again, I mean, there's a, there's an interest. This is an interesting finding because it tells you that generally speaking, the electoral side of democracy has progressed rather nicely in Latin America. I mean, with uh, with some blemishes, most recently seen in, in Bolivia, uh, fraud and shenanigans. Uh, uh, you know. It have become rare in Latin America uh, when it comes to elections. <clears throat> Latin America is also the region alongside parts of Europe that really has made the greatest advances in terms of uh, gender equality in politics. And the proportion of women in legislatures in, uh, in Latin America is above the world average, and four Latin American countries are among the world's top 10 uh, when it comes to the proportion of women in, in parliament. This is also very positive. Again, another finding linked to the electoral side of things, Latin America has the world's highest levels of electoral participation among all regions. Truth be told, this is connected to the prevalence of mandatory voting, compulsory voting, in, in Latin America. If I recall correctly, out of 17 countries in Latin America, 14 have different modalities of compulsory voting. But still, I mean, this, this matters. You know, it, it, it's a form of engagement of, the, of, of a very basic but relevant find. Now, the challenges, and they're many. It, number one, the sheer disparity in terms of democratic performance. I mean, it, it, just as you do for the rest of the world, in Latin America, you find all sorts of color combinations. And it's very interesting to see that this element in partial administration, which is, again, connected to the prevalence of corruption, well, I mean, this is where a few countries really score a, really have very low scores. So there's a, there's a cluster, I mean, and this is no surprise, there's a cluster of problems connected to the prevalence of corruption in Latin America. Um, and then alongside Africa and, and the Middle East, Latin America continues to be the region of the world where the highest proportion of countries with uh, problems of corruption, with high levels of corruption, uh, exist. And this is, this disparity, uh, you know, where you have Uruguay uh, at the top and Haiti at the bottom, this table includes only those countries uh, that can be regarded as a democracy. Stronger and weaker, but democracies. What is, this doesn't cover the cases that have stopped being democracies. And uh, as I mentioned before, the case of Nicaragua is a, uh, a very recent case. But the most striking case is that of Venezuela. Uh, this chart, these two uh, graphs, chart and graph, show this is 
the, the scores of Venezuela in 1996 across the five attributes of, a, of democracy. A, and this is Venezuela today. The lower a, this 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 lower a, performance bar bar <laughs> is uh, a, the performance of Venezuela today is uh, red throughout. And this is what I told you before. This is the score of Venezuela on the components of representative government between 1975 and 2018. It's the one case where you've gone from a high score all the way down through uh, a very low score uh, that actually has turned the country into an authoritarian regime. I mean, in 20 2017, as we know, the uh, parliament was stripped of all functions for all practical purposes, and, uh, and it, it, it ceased to exist uh, functionally. So the case of Venezuela is really, is really striking. Um, the second piece of bad news is the persistence of high levels of corruption and weak judiciaries. Here, on the left, we have on the red line a, the countries that score low when it comes to the absence of corruption. I mean, it, right? I mean, the, 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 the green line is the countries that score high when it comes to absence of corruption. And these are few and far between. The countries that score a, badly when it comes to corruption. Uh, they dipped for uh, until the mid '90s, and then they started to grow. And they this this indicator is pretty is pretty stagnant at the moment. And and same with judicial independence. I mean, the 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 red line is the proportion of countries that score low when it comes to judicial independence. And this it, it is again. I mean, it's basically basically stuck uh, for the past 20 or 25 years. It, this continues to be a very significant challenge. And of course, both, both charts are connected. I mean, it is extremely unlikely that you're going to be successful uh, against corruption if you don't have strong judicial institutions. I mean, this stands to reason. Um, the third finding uh, is that support for democracy is eroding very rapidly in Latin America. I mean, over the past decade alone, uh, support for democracy has fallen to the tune of 13 points. Um, and what is interesting is that his, this descent in, uh, in the level of support for democracy has been corresponded by, a, by an increase in the proportion of the population that is simply indifferent. Democracy. What we're witnessing in Latin America is the rise of the indifferent, as it were. But there's something very serious happening. And I suspect that this is connected to the fourth point, which is, well, we all know that Latin America's original sin is uh, extraordinarily high levels of inequality. And inequality in its, is a huge problem. But this chart I find particularly compelling because the, one of the consequences of such terribly high levels of inequality is a very toxic relationship, a very toxic perception of political systems. The perception of unfairness in the political system is extraordinarily prevalent in Latin America. In, only 17% of the population in Latin America are government uh, caters to all people. Uh, conversely, over 80% are convinced that the government is there to do the bidding of the powerful few. Uh, well, I mean, I would claim that this is one of the 
single most important pieces of information that you need to understand what's playing out on the streets in Latin America these days. It's the perception of unfairness of the political system connected to social economic inequalities. Now, this is, you know, I'm, I'm going very fast, and I am conscious of that, but in the interest of time, uh, as I said, you know, I'm cherry picking on some of the of the main themes that emerge from the from the report, but I, I certainly encourage you to uh, to read it. A few policy recommendations, and this uh, I guess these are valid for Latin America, but uh, more generally for the world as a whole. We hope the, the first is that I guess, Tony, a lot of the work that we have been doing for many years have focused, as you yourself mentioned, uh, on elections. And this is great, and I think real strides have been made when it comes to elections. But at this point, is a, I guess it is sorely needed that we go beyond that, that we get serious, a, or even more serious, about the work which is often very hard, very painstaking, very slow, of building institutions such as judiciaries, such as parliaments, political parties, eh, as well as informal institutions such as civil society and independent media. And here in this, in this line of building institutions, eh, let me stress something. You know, the older I get, the more convinced I am that judicial independence is probably the single most accurate barometer of democratic, of the quality of democracy writ large. I mean, the state of judicial independence, of judicial institutions, and the, the, the extent of autonomy and independence enjoyed by judicial institutions is a very, very telling sign of the quality of democracy as a whole. So building independent judiciaries is really of the essence we care about advancing democracy in the world. But also we have to deepen democracy through citizen participation in between elections, strengthen political representation of women and other marginalized groups, and try to reduce to the extent possible political and social polarization. Second, eh, we have to pay attention to the question of delivery, uh, which is truly of the essence and is at the, at the root of some of the things that we're seeing, not just in Latin America, but uh, all over the world. And this is a complicated question. You know, the question of delivery, of the ability of democracies to meet social demands. There are many things involved. I mean, there are questions of institutional design. There are questions, certainly in Latin America, about a tax structures. There are questions about the quality of public administration and public management. I mean, which are questions that have remained on the margins of the discussion of democracy. We have to bring all those things to the to the center of the discussion on democracy. Um, it, we cannot sidestep the issue of delivery uh, uh, anymore if we care about. Um, about protecting democracy. And this includes, by the way, I mean, the question of delivery includes, of course, the question of being very aggressive against the odds, apparently, very aggressive in fighting corruption and the impunity derived from corruption. Finally, a democracy support should be evidence, context, and performance based. And this is exactly what we're trying a, to do here. We're trying to help folks out there, and to help our own work, uh, be more sensitive to the context in terms of uh, helping democracy advance. I mean, we have to tailor democratic assistance to the to the context, and to I mean, all the, that heat map with the different patterns has to be taken seriously. In mean, some countries. The real issue is about elections. In some of the countries, it's about rule of law. In some of the countries, it's the lack of engagement from the, the, the citizens. 
So it's, there are many stories out there, and we have to, uh, on the basis of evidence, we have to tailor our assistance to, to each of those stories. Link democratic assistance to data on democratic performance, and hopefully you will come to see our GSOD, Global State of Democracy Indices, as an instrument to track democratic progress. So that's one of the, of the things that we're a, that we intend to do with this report, I mean, to put a tool in your hands to track democratic progress. A, we hope that a, the report will be a key input to advance democratic uh, agenda, because ultimately, a, you know, a, important as, as democracy is, I think it's also a crucial a crucial instrument to deliver sustainable development. Sustainable democracy is by far the best way to build sustainable development and to achieve the 2030 agenda. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you for your patience. And by all means, don't walk. Run to get your report. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Kevin. Thank you for that uh, very quick but thorough uh, summary of the, uh, of the global findings, as well as those um, concerning Latin America. Kevin said, "Run I, to get a report." I thought all of you would stand up and walk to the uh, front desk. <laughs> there are, or, or run uh, to the front desk. There are copies of the, of the report uh, available, um, and please do uh, take, take, take on one of those. I'm sure they don't want to carry those back. Uh, on or to your next. Uh, I think your next uh, launch is in Mexico. No, we already did that okay, one so, a couple days ago. So if they don't want to carry those back to Stockholm. Um, indeed, this is a, a tremendous effort. Uh, congratulations to you and your colleagues. Uh, and it is an invaluable resource to policymakers, uh, researchers, and practitioners. Um, at this point in our agenda, we'll turn to the two discussants uh, that were briefly mentioned. Uh, by, by Mike Shifter in his, in his uh, opening remarks. Uh, and I'll make just the briefest of, of uh, introductions as well before we turn it over to them. Uh, to my far left, Ambassador Jacobson, who, uh, as we know, is, is Mike Shifter's boss, as well as a member of the Inter-American Inter Dialogue. When she's not doing that, she's senior advisor at the Albright Stonebridge Group, where she advises clients in their Americas practice. Uh, we all know her as the U.S. Ambassador to Mexico, where she served from June 6, uh, 2016 through May of 2018, managing an array of issues from security and, and immigration to trade and investment and human rights during the difficult and challenging time. She's also enjoyed, a, of course, a 30-year career in, uh, in, diplo in diplomacy and state departments uh, and has held a number of high-level positions, both in Washington and in missions. To the ambassador's right, uh, we have Tom Carruthers, who of course is known to many of us as the Senior Vice President of Studies at Carnegie Endowment for National Peace, where he oversees all research at the endowment and directs the Democracy, Conflict, and Governance Program. Uh, of course, as was mentioned earlier, he's a leading authority that we all look to for, for uh, incisive analysis on international support to democracy, human rights, and governance, and rule of law. He's a prolific researcher and, and writer on democracy-related topics, and recently published uh, uh, the book, Democracy is <coughs> Divided, The Global Challenge of Political Polarization. With those brief introductions, I'll now turn it over to you for her response. Uh, well, ask Tom, please. <laughs> okay. uh, thank you very much. I appreciate the invitation to be here. And first, let me just say I want to congratulate Kevin and International Idea on his appointment as Secretary General. International Idea is a valuable organization, but I'm certain under Kevin's leadership, it's going to become even more valuable. And I want to wish you well in that process and the organization. Let me just make a couple of brief remarks about the overall report and then a few comments on Latin America. Uh, we live in a time when uh, 
general analyses of the state of democracy in the world are, are ever present. Uh, I got one the other day from my next door neighbor uh, who, who offered one to me. It was only a couple of sentences long, but it got the essence of things. Um, and this report, I think, manages to avoid uh, what I see as several of the shortcomings of many of these analyses. Uh, first, it does not offer a single factor explanation. We've slipped often into saying that democracy is in trouble because there's a rise of authoritarian populism, or democracy is in trouble because uh, social media and other forms of new information and communications technologies are subverting democracy. It's not that simple, and we have to be very careful about these kind of simplistic single factor explanations that I see proliferating. Second, it does not, <clears throat> a characteristic of many of the analyses that I, that I see are that they essentially project out American, sometimes British, a kind of Anglo-American gloom about our own conditions onto the world and read the world through the lens of what's happening here, Britain and say, it's just like it. See, they've, they're using the same language as the leader here whom we might feel is, is not very democratic in some ways. And we're reading into the world an Anglo-American lens, whereas the particularities are very striking in many different places, and we're losing sometimes the analytic complexity in which and third, the report avoids the reflexive pessimism or overly negative view that's very common. It's very hard right now to get the right level of pessimism on the law. It's a very alarming situation, but when things are alarming, you know, if there's a fire in the building, what you don't do is start shrieking and running around, you know, like crazy. What you do is you think about where the fire is coming from, what needs to be done, how to get people out, how to get people where they need to be or whatever. And what we need now is a measured level of alarm rather than a kind of reflexive pessimism or a reflexive alarm. Yet neither do we need to be complacent because things are serious both at home and abroad. And this report, I think it's balanced right in that regard, and I, I commend it in, in that regard. <clears throat> now, the other sort of global remark I would make is that I think the community of transnational actors who engage in democracy support, of whom you know, we have several represented here, but more generally, are in a very difficult time because they're, ex they're experiencing a kind of triple shock. And it's very difficult <clears throat> to come to terms with this triple shock. The first element of the shock is that the large body, approximately 100 to 120 countries of quote transitional countries in which these organizations have primarily been engaged over the last 30 years, is proving to be a much more difficult terrain for democratization than many of us expected. Uh, in the past few decades. And what looked like you know, pushing boulders down a hill now looks like pushing boulders up a hill or getting run over by boulders that are running mm -hmm. down at you. And in particular, some of the larger non-Western democracies or non-North American, non-European non democracies that this community hoped would be vital partners in this process are not proving to be or having serious struggles with democracy. And I'm thinking here of India in particular, which is a particular disappointment, Brazil, South Africa, which has been caught up in its, its internal problems with state capture. Turkey, which many people hope would be an example to a number of Muslim-majority countries of democracy. So in the first case, this community is dealing with the terrain in which it's working is proving to be much rockier, and there are fewer allies than were hoped. The second shock, of course, is this: at the very time this community is experiencing that first shock, democracy and the wealthy established democracies is experiencing much greater troubles very suddenly than was anticipated even five years ago. And the community is having trouble taking forward the imperative that, that uh, Anthony Banbury mentioned of doing this together. There's an old paradigm of we're the democracies, you're the ones struggling with this, we're going to help you. That paradigm clearly no longer applies. We're having trouble replacing it with the paradigm of, yes, we're experiencing difficulties. You are too. Let's work together. It's easy to say, but it's very hard to put in practice because of the structures, the systems, the sort of traditions in the field, and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> I just saw one of the principles in the new Foreign Assistance Review that was carried out in the United States. One of the ten guiding principles of U.S. foreign assistance is now going to be uh, exporting the U.S. model. Um, I would say that's out of sync uh, with this new reality. Uh, but it's hard. It's hard to get over that reflex. That's the second shock. And then the third shock is authoritarian resilience. Uh, you know, 20 years ago, there were a few books about the end of tyranny and how, uh, you know, in a couple of decades, there wouldn't be any more authoritarian regimes. 
instead major authoritarian powers have gotten back up on their feet or proven more resilient in different ways and need to make names there if they're known to us. And this authoritarian resilience is a challenge both because these countries are in some cases holding themselves out as models to others, but also acting much more assertively and self-confidently across borders to undercut democracy. So this triple shock is a lot to take on. <clears throat> and this community is only at the start of a reflective process that will lead us somewhere better. And this report, I think, can contribute to that. Now, a couple of comments about Latin America. Um, Latin America, like every region, shares some common features with the, the overall trend about democracy in the world, and then some distinctive features. I think the common features are several. I mean, there's a number, but I would just highlight four. Uh, first, uh, <clears throat> when you look around the world at the citizen discontent that's bubbling up in the form of so many protests, you see a kind of iron triangle of causes. The first is that citizens are very unhappy about inequality, unfairness, injustice, a sense of poor delivery, and so forth. So that's driving a lot of citizens. Second is a tremendous amount of anger over corruption, systemic corruption, and the sense of entrenched corruption that is, that is untouchable. And third, they're angry about political overreach, uh, either manipulating an election, going past a constitutional term limit on power, um, decreasing autonomy that was promised, like in Hong Kong, or so forth. And so this iron triangle of, of anger over economic conditions and equality and fairness delivery, the corruption and the political overreach, if you look at any one protest in the world, you can measure the temperature of it by looking at these three factors and see some combination. That's very, so when we look at the protests in Latin America and the political churning that's going on in particular in South America, the underlying drivers are quite similar to those whether you look at Lebanon or Iraq or uh, many other places, Romania, <coughs> Hong Kong, etc., at least in certain ways. Uh, second, the phenomenon polarization. Uh, Michael mentioned a book I've done on that recently. There is really a trend towards greater pol By polarization, we say very serious divisions within a democracy that a democracy has trouble containing because they represent such conflicting visions of how the country should move forward that they have trouble living together within a democracy. That's becoming a characteristic of many democracies, and that's what we see in South America is becoming a kind of a, a festival of polarization these days in a negative sense, but it's not out of sync in that sense with what's happening elsewhere. Third, democratic troubles at home are spilling over to become regional problems in a number of places. The biggest regional problem Latin America has is Venezuela is bleeding to death. Um, and as it's bleeding, it's, you know, it's spreading its pain and its suffering and its misery out to its neighbors in different ways. And it's causing a lot of problems. Um, and so the biggest regional problems in a number of places are coming from democratic problems at home. If you look at Turkey's democratic side and the effects on that in Turkish policy in Syria and Kurds and other things, or India's policy towards Kashmir, which is causing a lot of regional tension because it grows out of the backsliding of Indian democracy. You see a pattern of it's bad enough that there are democratic troubles at home, but they create regional problems as well, and Latin America is experiencing that too. Um, and then the fourth issue, which has become common, of course, is the multiplication of transnational actors across borders beyond the West who are trying to control political destinies or events in other places who often have anti-democratic aims. The old world of the West being the main actor across borders to try to influence political change is no longer the case. We're often a minority actor in many parts of the world. Latin America actually is experiencing that a bit less than other regions like the Balkans or the Middle East or Sub-Saharan Africa or Asia, but it's felt in Latin America as well with the influence of non-Western uh, powers who are trying to do that. So there are some important common elements of what's happening in Latin America, but there are a couple of distinctive things that I just want to note in any way. The first is that Latin America is actually the only part of the world that's experiencing a lot of left-wing populism. For Latin Americans, it's just sort of so used to it, you don't realize how unusual it is. Uh, there are very few left-wing populists in the world um, these days. Re the redistributive economic programs that were put forward in Venezuela or to some extent in Bolivia or in Ecuador at a certain point and by the, the Kirchner's in Argentina and, and is actually quite unusual. Most populism is of the right. Now, Latin America has joined that with Brazil and its, it's sort of right-wing populism. But in general, Latin America is quite exceptional in having a heavy dose of, of left-wing populism as a continuing feature of Latin American politics. 
Second, related to that, Latin America is quite unusual in that the left-right divide, you look at Argentina going back and forth between you know, a left, left of center choice and, and a right of center choice back and forth and, and other places as well, is not what's happening in most parts of the world anymore politically. In, in Europe, the big debate is over you know, the center, center right, center right versus the edges. And in India, Hindu nationalism versus the secular conception of India, it's not a left-right dynamic. Um, Left-right politics, in most parts of the world, when you go to workshops and conferences, everyone says, oh, we're way beyond that. That's no longer the dynamic of politics in this region. Latin America, when I go talk to my Latin American friends or go to the region, I'm struck by how it remains a region caught in this, in this paradigm of trying to find a, a plausible alternative between you know, illiberal redistributive policies that undercut democratic systems, so the actors cut down institutions, versus market neoliberal policies that leave people unsatisfied and so forth. That dynamic of that is not what's going on in most of the rest of the world. Um, third, Latin America still has a problem of the overhang of militaries. Of course, that does exist in other places like Egypt and Pakistan, but the the ghosts of the militaries in Latin America are still, you know, walk the attics of Latin American societies and systems in ways which we see coming out in different ways. Sometimes in very heavy-handed ways like Venezuela and in certain ways like Bolivia and so forth. And then a fourth distinctive feature is this is hard for many Latin Americans to appreciate, that Latin America has actually gone further in creating regional mechanisms to support democracy than Africa, the Middle East, or Asia. They're not very good in Latin America. They don't work very well, they're frustrating, but they're actually better. They're actually further along. There's something, you know, there's something significant to them and we shouldn't give up on them. Latin America remains a region where there is a higher level of consonants in thinking, culture, and so forth, but also in these underlying norms, as you said, it's the region of the developing world. We can still call it that. Latin America is the most democratic, and that's reflected in these regional mechanisms. So we shouldn't give up on them and note that they are quite distinct. So some kudos for the overall report, a warning of where this community is in terms of the triple shock that it's experiencing and some commonalities and differences with respect to Latin America, which will come out of this report. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. We look forward to coming back and maybe uh, going further into some of those comments uh, discussion. Uh, Master David. Thank you, Michael. Um, I, I'm going to start by saying that as a practitioner for more than three decades, um, I will be both probably less profound and more disorganized uh, than my predecessors. Um, it, it for certain, uh, less than Tom Carruthers, who really is sort of the, the guru for many of us on this issue. Um, but, but I'm reminded when I read this report a little bit of an old joke, which wasn't my father's, but he used to tell it, which was, to me, sort of democratic health is a bit like the weather. Everybody talks about it. Nobody does much about it. Um, the fact is that I think in, in Tony and Kevin's opening remarks, they really emphasized the action por portion of this, um, whether it's being a do tank or changing a mission for IFAS. For practitioners, we really welcome that because while the report is incredibly valuable for policymakers and practitioners, um, and I'll, I'll go into that in one second, um, ultimately, it is what we do about that, and frankly, while not wanting it to fall into the funk of everything is negative, and I do think the report is enormously helpful in that, um, if we can't come out of this with ways, uh, really quite a sense of urgency in the ways we act uh, to support and advance democracy uh, globally, um, I think it, it won't have done what, what both its authors hope and what many of us in this room hope to see. Um, I do think the report is particularly useful for practitioners and policymakers, in part because of the maturity, the sophistication of the variables. Um, the plethora of the data can be a little bit overwhelming, but I was particularly encouraged to see those five attributes which, as discussed earlier, go way beyond, beyond the, the exuberance we had, irrational though it may have been, of thinking elections was sufficient. Um, so I think that's incredibly important. Um, 
I think, you know, the ultimate conclusion for, for me is that the world needs more, um, but most importantly, better democracies. Um, that the quality of democracies around the world has been, in some ways, so partial and so halting that the existential question about whether people support democracy, in some ways, is, is not able to be answered, right? Because those democracies that they've experienced have been so uh, yellow in the, in the terms of the report that the rejection isn't necessarily democracy, it's their democracy. It's what they have seen and experienced of democracy. And so the urgency in some respect is better democracies in order to bolster that, um, that support for the, the uh, concept overall. I think for me, um, looking at it from a Latin Americanist's perspective, there's one, and it's been mentioned a couple of times, we in the Latin America community often are dismayed by the fact that when global reports come out, um, often in the past on things like proliferation or um, even economic conversations, Latin America can often be overlooked. Um, we can, of course, take comfort from the fact that the number one worst performing standout uh, in this report is in Latin America, and that is Venezuela. That is a dubious distinction, um, but certainly Latin America is not ignored in this report. Um, I think the, there are a couple of other things that, that I think are really important, both for Latin America from my perspective uh, as part of the report. One is, Kevin talked about the prevalence of corruption being among the most closely, or perhaps the most closely correlated indicator with um, sustainable development uh, and, and perhaps with democracy, and yet, we see that the proportion of countries who are dealing adequately with corruption, who are, who are high in indicators, um, has not changed in about 40 years. And I think that, to me, seems to be one of the most uh, important findings of the study, because we know that that is a critical issue in Latin America. It is not being dealt with in a way that people see as adequate or um, competent. Uh, and therefore, it, it gives rise to some of the, the backsliding and the concern that we've seen. Second of all, um, overall, despite being a practitioner and being in government for 30 years, I think one of the most critical findings for Latin America is the backsliding or the erosion in civic space, in space for civil society. Um, I have often said to people that, you know, in some ways, my two years in Peru, uh, in which I saw three governments, um, was an example of what can be done if the international community is forced by anti-democratic means by then President Fujimori to put all of its funds in civil society. You created, in some respects, an excessively robust civil society, but one that was then able to be counted upon in many ways to work with the international community back towards democracy. And so I think that the closing of civil space, the criticism of uh, NGOs, the press, and civil society is among the most dangerous features that we see in Latin America right now. Um, in the, the other two things I will say that I think are, in general, very, very important for uh, Latin America are the judicial independence question which I, I haven't necessarily gotten to all of the depth of the data in the report, but I think that it is extremely worrisome that progress we thought was being made on judicial independence is, is really not evident around the region. I think it is one of the hardest measures to attack. Um, it is stubbornly resistant, not because of just because of executive overreach, but also because of the nature of judiciaries. Um, but we have seen judicial reform throughout the hemisphere to what are supposed to be more agile, more responsive, more transparent, more adversarial systems, and that has not resulted in increases uh, in judicial independence. Um, the other thing I think is really important is if you look at the issue of fairness, of injustice, 
Um, one of the most interesting things in the analysis of Chile, um, which a recent uh, commentator said, you know, if anyone tells you they weren't surprised by the protests in Chile, they're lying. Um, but one of the most interesting things about the theme and unifying factor of those protests is the concept of injustice, in particular phrased as maltrato, right? Being mistreated, a lack of dignity. And it, it's, a, it's a tough aspect of all of this to get at until you have findings like this, which give you the data to say what in particular has gone wrong such that people feel that way about the country and the region that we all congratulated ourselves was doing the best. So I think that's a very, very useful um, data point for all of us. Um, I will close with two points about um, Mexico. One, um, when I was in Mexico, one of the things that I consistently said and I thought it was important to talk about was corruption is not cultural in the sense of being somehow ingrained. There is corruption everywhere. The United States has an entire segment of the Department of Justice called public corruption and they prosecute and have opened somewhere between eight and 900 cases a year that they're prosecuting against US public officials. It is not the existence of corruption, it really is impunity. It is the failure to do anything about it in a way that is perceived as fair to the public that really is the problem. And then I'll return finally to Ernesto Zedillo's um, response to a question when he was asked some years ago, but I think its durability is one of its, um, one of its concerns when he was asked what the top three priorities for Mexico are, and this was after he had left the presidency, but, but his response was rule of law, rule of law, and rule of law. And I think that remains um, sort of the essence of this report, the cluster of issues that we think of as rule of law are still the things being um, unaddressed and the Achilles heel, the weakness of democracy uh, in Latin America, certainly, from my experience. Thank you both. Thank you both for enriching our uh, discussion of this important report and its remarks. Um, I wanted to give Kevin, he seemed to be seriously writing out some, some notes in response to a couple of comments and give him a chance to, to respond. Thank you, Michael, and thank you so much, uh, Tom and, and Roberto, for very, very interesting uh, comments uh, about some of the findings of the, of the report and also the things that are not there. Uh, two very brief uh, reactions to some of the points raised, um, and there are a lot of things that I could say, but I'm, I'm going to focus on two things. I mean, in the case of, of Tom, uh, the, the whole issue of I ideology, the persistence of the left-right axis in Latin America. I don't know. I mean, there's a, a, I'm not sure, Tom. Um, I mean, it, it, it doesn't pass the smell test to me in, in a lot of places. I mean, what's the ideology of Bukele itself? And part of the reason is that the party systems in Latin America are so, uh, I mean, in, in such a shambles that most party systems have, to some extent, become, you know, a riddle with a personal vehicles, you know, a, a kind of a one man shows that they are able to win elections, you know, in the, so I'm not sure that uh, our our political debates, and certainly not our party systems, are structured in a, in a left-right axis. But my, rather than that, I mean, which is, I mean, it's an interesting discussion to to have, and it's a, I guess, a, it's, it's a subject to confirmation uh, from, from some kind of data. I, I would just like to add that whether that axis is still prevalent in Latin America or not, it, there's another axis emerging which concerns me a lot in Latin America, which is 
the emergence all over the place of religious groups as political actors. The invasion of the political sphere by a religiously motivated actors. And this is happening all over the place. In a way, we are importing the culture wars from the US into and injecting them into Latin American politics. And, a, and I'm very much afraid that the consequences a, can be dire and are being dire already. Because this is going to add to polarization. This is going to create another axis of polarization. In that. And then, you know, one, one small a, good note to one of the comments made by, by Roberta. I mean, I, I agree that truly the, a, the inability a, shown by the data to do something effective about corruption globally and in Latin America is, is, is terrible news. And it's, I mean, it's terrible news in its own right, but it's also terrible news when you consider, and this, this I know more or less well, because two or three years ago I wrote a, uh, a report published by the Dialogue on, on corruption scandals in, in Latin America. And one of the things that came out very strongly uh, in the course of that research was that social media was a very powerful tool in the fight against corruption. You know, just it, it allowed people to a, uncover and denounce a corruption and demand action against corruption in a, in, a, in a much better way than before social media came along. A, well, this, this combination is terrible. I mean, when you see, I mean, the inability, the practical inability to do something about corruption combined with the increasing stridents about corruption nurtured by social media is a very toxic combination. I mean, the dissonance between the demand to do something about corruption and the ability to denounce corruption and the inability to effectively put in place measures against corruption is, I mean, only bad news can come from, bad, from that dissonance. And, and seriously, I mean, this is, this is food for thought, and, and, and believe me, I've been scratching my head for a while thinking about this. I cannot think of a single case in the world of a democracy that has been able to dramatically reduce corruption levels a, in a sustained way. Seriously, I mean, you find cases like Singapore, but then again, Singapore is not a democracy. But give me one case, one case of a democracy that has been able to reduce corruption in a sustained way over a long period of time. I can't think of a single case. So, you know, that's a problem. <laughs> yeah, and that's, that's that for now. Perhaps not the best example that I can think of is organized, fighting organized crime in Italy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The recent measures are in terms of success, but there was a period in the past 20 years when that was, that was pointed to, and at least our practice of international development, but being an example of how uh, you know, there could be an organized effort to, uh, to confront organized crime. It's really part of the corruption or triangle in Italy. Um, nevertheless, uh, I wanted to follow up, if I could, with Tom on, on this issue of polarization. You've studied it closely, you've, you've written about it, you and your colleagues have, have researched it. Um, it is a, a global phenomenon, it, it's, it's unique and, and different and depending on the context. With regard to Latin America, Kevin mentioned in his, in his presentation the original sin of social inequality. Um, is, is that, in your research, make polarization even more difficult to address or more prevalent or more pernicious in Latin America compared to other parts of the world? Um, inequality per se doesn't always lead to severe polarization. 
And I mean, but if it becomes mobilized around two conflicting political projects, one which is, a, say, a redistributive program, political action program, economic action program, butts up against uh, a different program, a neoliberal program, and says, this is the answer to inequality. We, the Chavistas, have the answer. And you, the neoliberals, are against a neoliberal, say, no, we need growth. We have to grow our way out of inequality. You're just going to create other economic problems. Inequality can become the basis of a deep battle within the society. The polarization around the world, but it's interesting, it's good that you mentioned religion, Kevin, because it has a number of different bases, what we find in our study. In some cases, it is ideological, like Venezuela, related also to social class, but it is ideological. But in many other countries, religion is proving highly polarized. In India, I recommend a piece in the New Yorker last week on India's democratic crisis. You see the power of rising fundamentalism in India. Same issue in Turkey, where sort of more fundamentalist line, the AKP versus the rest of the country. Israeli politics very, very polarized, and religion is playing a role, Poland, and so forth. So Latin America, unfortunately, is adding a new cleavage around religion. religion and then you have ethnic-driven ethnic, well, ethnic -driven polarization, which has been more of a feature in the Balkans and Sub-Saharan Africa, although it plays a role in, in Bolivia as well. Uh, but I, I can't resist. I love a good argument, Kevin. So we argue about this. Too often in Washington, everyone pretends to agree with each other. So I'm glad you raised this about the left right. You know, maybe, I'm just thinking it through out loud, I mean, maybe it's a bit your perspective as Central American, which I come to the region with more experience in South America. I look at Argentina and, and the alternation between the Peronist and the alternative. I look at Brazil these days with a very right-wing government versus Lula and the PT tradition. I look at Colombia still fighting over some very deep left-right divides. I think Bolivia's divide could be understood in somewhat left-right terms. Chile still discusses these issues of, of you know, it has left-right choices in the society, Ecuador, to some extent. I think in South America, maybe, it's more prevalent, whereas Central American political systems have hardened into, as you say, very personalized sort of machine politics and, and elite politics that is, pretends to have ideological choices, but isn't really that. It's neither Honduras or Guatemala or um, uh, Panama or others are, are a bit... I wanted to ask you a question if I could and ask you, you we, the report addresses events and, and data through 2018. This has been a very eventful year within the region. Uh, and I'm wondering your thoughts on trend lines as it relates to the data that's been presented in this year's report forward. I particularly think of Mexico. I was there recently and met with some Mexican friends um, and heard their concerns about the hollowing out of institutions and, and, and many of the factors that are, that are mentioned as concerns in the report. Um, and I've asked for your response to that. I know you follow developed there closely um, and would like your thoughts on, on where we stand today in Mexico. Yeah, I mean, I, I hear the same concerns and to some extent, I guess, I would say what surprises me about people who are concerned and their friends and thoughtful analysts is that they're surprised. Um, President Lopez Obrador came to power um, not pretending to be an institutionalist. Right? He did not pretend to love democratic institutions and want to strengthen them. He came to power talking very much in the I alone can do X and Y, and, and got a resounding mandate for it. But in fact, the sort of weakening of institutions, the attack on institutions, by which I mean the judiciary, the media, civil society, independent regulatory agencies, um, and the centralization of decision making is not particularly surprising. I mean, to some extent, what's been surprising is that it's not a highly competent government in carrying that out, and that may ultimately be a saving grace. But, and, and he has, you know, he has almost no checks on his power, right? There's no legislative check given his majorities, and even the judicial check is, is weak and maybe weakening. 
I think you know one of the things that is most concerning and will be interesting to see in how it plays out is the corruption question because he came to power almost entirely on an anti-corruption platform. He has held some very public, you know, anti-corruption efforts, i.e., going after the huachicoleros, the gasoline thieves, and so forth, and 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 within the energy structure. Um, the corruption. Um, but Mexico passed a series of either six or seven laws two and a half years ago that were among the most, well, among the best anti-corruption systems on paper um, anywhere. Um, but like everything else, it's not the laws, it's the implementation of them. And he almost never mentions that anti-corruption system and completing its its implementation or energetically pursuing the institutionalization of anti-corruption efforts, and that's part of the problem. So I have very deep concerns about the resilience of democracy there um, and the weakening of institutions because I don't see them being addressed in a way that is sustainable, right, over over time, that is strengthened at the end of his sexenio than at the beginning. And that is in the rule of law cluster, not pushing for the completion of the judicial reform and, and its full implementation, making that more robust, or in the anti-corruption sector. And I don't, I will say, I don't think having revocatorios, having referenda on, on politically elected leaders can be a substitute for all of the variables we're looking at. I just came from Mexico. And one of the things that really struck me that speaks exactly to what you're saying now is the virtual, the almost complete liquefaction of the opposition, which is always a bad sign. Uh, you know that that could be the natural check on 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 Abdul's power, but it, it doesn't seem. Well, to I agree with that, but I think the most overwhelming feature of his election was a was a disgust with those parties that um, that really seemed entirely legitimate because they they had not delivered on so many of these these indicators. Well, one other thing I would mention is that. Um, this issue of referenda, of popular consultas over everything from whether we should have a new airport in Mexico City to where we should put a biomass you know, feature to the president serving the rest of his term, really concerns me because it moves us, um, and I'm not comparing uh, AMLO to Chavez, because I think that's not a useful con comparison in some ways, but this notion of direct democracy versus representative democracy, I think, is among the most worrisome. Um, what I've seen in direct democracy is mob rule in the end, and not highly representative, which is one of the reasons I think the sophistication of the indicators in the study is most crucial. Okay. You mentioned the direct democracy. It would be interesting how that's dealt with. Uh, should those go forward? And that uh, referendum process um, actually be exercised uh, given the positive things there's about direct democracy in the report elsewhere. Um, Tom, you mentioned also, I think, the relative success of multilateralism or multilateral institutions that relates to democratic, democratic uh, support uh, and principles within Latin America. I wonder, Kevin, you served at the, at the OAS, and I wonder if you could offer perhaps words about the role that you see the OAS play for. They just, in this recent uh, couple of months, done something that uh, didn't happen during your service to the OAS, really taking a, a clear stand uh, in Bolivia with, with the audit of the election results. Is this a trend that we're seeing that you think with a more active, engaged OAS as it relates to the election, election uh, monitoring and election observation efforts? I didn't use the word success. It's a very often disappointing that they're stronger relative uh, relative to what exists in other places. Just thank you. <laughs> <laughs> though, though 
shown that there are clinical examples uh, in Africa, uh, from the African Union as well, right? Uh, well, I mean, there are, I mean, the OAS is all uh, governmental regional organizations. It is a complex creature, you know, and, and I know very well because I used to be there a, a election monitoring operation. They usually go about their 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 job in a in a very autonomous way, in a generally autonomous way, and they're very, very professional. I mean, I have the highest regard for the people that work there. A, I think what they did in Bolivia was not just brave, but a, a very competent. I mean, the report that they put out, laying out, laying bare the, the shenanigans that went on during the, during the election, is really a landmark. And I certainly hope that they continue that way. Yet, you also find other uh, other things in the in the way of mixed <laughs> signals coming from the OAS. I mean, I have to say that uh, some of the uh, some of the noises made by the by the current Secretary General, you know, like respect and other uh, ways, but some of the noises that he made uh, before the election in Bolivia. Uh, Supporting the notion that uh, indefinite re-election was a human right, it was exactly the line that was peddled by Evo Morales. It were not held. And now he, he seems to have swung, you know, all the way to the other to the other end, saying that that the I mean I'm not gonna get into the discussion of whether it was a coup or it wasn't a coup. I mean you know, the, the, the military suggestion, uh, you know, the suggestion made by the military in, in Bolivia uh, was a great thing, you know, and that they restored a, a democratic order in, in, in Bolivia. I mean, it, it, it's problematic. I mean, some of the, I mean, perhaps what I'm trying to, to get at is that there doesn't seem to be a coherent doctrine about democracy uh, uh, in Latin America, currently at the OAS. Other than the case of Venezuela, which has uh, sucked up <coughs> all oxygen uh, in the OAS. I mean, that's, a, in my opinion, I think the, 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 the sheer amount of attention devoted to Venezuela has uh, done its service. I don't mean to take us too far away from the report itself, and, and we've done a lot of discussion of, of um, both the report, its analysis, its data, uh, but I can't help but ask a couple of questions about current events that have taken place recently as they relate to the state of democracy in the region uh, and, and reflect upon perhaps their, their meaning within the state of global democracy. Uh, we, we've come to the top of the hour. Um, yeah, I think a few, few questions. Two questions from the from the audience. We do have a microphone that we are uh, circulating. If you indicate your interest, and uh, I'd ask that you identify yourself, uh, your affiliation. Um, Thank you. Yanira Soto uh, from the OAS. Um, I've been working on the democracy portfolio for a long time. Um, thank you for this uh, uh, panel. It was uh, very stimulating. I'd like to ask Tom. Is about his comment on regional mechanisms. I, I think uh, this is an area where we can continue to work on, and you mentioned it, and I think that is a, an opportunity for the audience to continue to work on. And you said it was something that was um, advanced in the Latin American context as opposed to other, other regions. I've been very much committed to that kind of institutional strengthening uh, regional mechanisms, consensus around instruments that bring together the member states. And I thought I'd ask you what you thought about 
How can we continue to strengthen the intergovernmental organizations that uphold these instruments and that continue to promote the importance of these regional mechanisms for strengthening democracy in the region? Let's take another question before uh, Daniel Michael, I'm just a private citizen interested in the topic. Could you address um, how big of a threat narcotics trafficking is to the progress of democracy in Latin America? Two very good questions. Uh, Tom, could you address the first one? Yeah. yeah, I'll just be brief, and I actually, I think Kevin probably have more interesting thoughts than I would. Um, and you're right about Africa. We're doing a couple of cases, like Gambia, has done some really good things with regional mechanisms, even though South Africa's role in Zimbabwe is very disappointing. So it's a mixed picture, but we're going to write the flag there. Um, you know, I think the regional mechanisms have struggled, as, as Kevin highlighted, with Venezuela, which is like a black hole of the, the tension. And so the price has undercut the regional mechanisms because of the underlying polarization around it. And so, in general, the big challenge has been getting beyond the coup paradigm of regional mechanisms. <coughs> they only should engage when there's a sort of a decisive coup. And instead, we have a situation like what Roberta described in Mexico. That's the kind of challenge to democracy in Latin America that regional mechanisms need to be more engaged in. But of course, that's more sensitive because we're going to like, hey, we're just carrying out some policies here. We're doing it our own way, and don't tell us about that. Using the kind of standards that are before in a report like this. I think we need to see movement. Whereas the European Union is a bit of a model in that regard because it's now facing positive and negative, but facing backsliding among its members like Hungary and Poland. It's having to confront how do we get involved when there's a decline in judicial independence in Poland. And so actually there are mechanisms in the European Union that are challenging Poland and saying, hey, we do have standards for judicial independence in the European Union, we're violating them. So looking to those examples of how do you engage short of a coup or short of a stolen election with this kind of backsliding, I think it's the key to moving forward. Uh, if, if I could answer um, the last question, Daniel's question, I, I think that the role of narcotics trafficking, and, and Tom talked a little bit about the non-state actors. I think this is one of them, transnational criminal organizations, in um, further weakening both the relatively weak in democratic institutions that exist in the region, but also impeding their progress, if one tries, cannot be overstated. Um, we're talking about vast amounts of money pumped into a system, um, whether for electoral corruption or, or other to ply their trade, or, and, and the undermining of, of governments. Um, because unlike the FARC or others, actors, revolutionary actors, they don't necessarily want to take over government, they simply want a compliant government. Um, but also, obviously, the impact of um, very high levels of violence, enormous amounts of arms, um, more than 70% in Mexico coming from the United States, of course, those features really impact, I think, in an extremely negative way, the both the ability um, and the willingness um, of governments and civil society to, to strengthen the democratic institutions that are necessary to fight those criminal organizations. So it's it's enormously um, it's enormously uh, it's devastating, and I think it's one of the reasons that governments in the region I think began to recognize that we had to get past the sort of us versus them, supply versus demand debate. Because even when demand wasn't as high in Latin America, or you could argue this is not our problem, this is your problem, the weakening and the corrosive nature of these actors on their own democratic systems means it impacts those countries um, in ways that are just as devastating as, as drugs in the United States. Okay. Just a brief comment about, about the last question, which I think is, is an absolute crucial question is Latin America. Actually, I would uh, I would say, Tom, that uh, we would do well to add the looming presence of drug trafficking and organized crime as another very distinctive feature of the challenges that democracies in Latin America are, are, are facing. I don't think that any other 
uh, faces this, this challenge to the same extent. Uh, and it's a challenge that really goes beyond democracy. I mean, uh, what is at stake in many places in Latin America is the authority of the state as such. So it's a problem that goes beyond the kind of political regime that you have. I mean, it's a, it's a question of whether the state will be able to have the legitimate monopoly over the monopoly over legitimate violence in a, in a, in a certain context. I mean, go ask the folks in the favelas in Brazil, you know, whether a judicial institutions matter in their community. It's a, it's a different ball game. And it's a, it's, a, it's a ball game that questions the very authority of the state, not even of the political regime that you may that you may have. Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> first of all, thank you, thank you all for your great comments. Uh, and uh, the question is, the one thing that nobody has mentioned, and I'm surprised a little bit, is that we talk about left and right and class differences, but the, in the Chile case, and the burner and I heard this presentation, generational generation. And when I see your chart, Kevin, it talks about increasing indifference. If you could, if you break that down, how much is that can be traced in terms of a new generation that is just different and just this is not a big concern for the new generation of, of the right or the left. So I you know and she she claimed in her presentation, right, for those who are above thirty five there's, there's a certain reality, and below 35, and that's the cleavage, that's the divide. And even Colombia, so a lot of the protests recently are all by younger people. So I wonder if you could comment on that, both in Latin America, but also globally, Tom, if that's a, if that, if that's a relevant issue. And there's a very quick question for Kevin in Costa Rica. I'm curious to know what would have to happen in Nicaragua for it to go in the same column as Venezuela? Briefly, Mike, but yeah, it's an explosive issue in the Middle East and Sub Saharan Africa and Tunisia. Some countries, the number is 80% of people are under 30 years old in Nigeria. And it's coming as an issue in Lebanon. The protests there, people are very surprised by the cross sectarian nature of the protests, and it's partly because it's a generational revolt against uh, the elders. So we're starting to see it. It hasn't yet taken political mobilization, it formed a political institutionalization around the divide, so you don't yet have party politics to reflect that, but it's undercutting the existing parties. Last word, Kevin. Yes. The question of, of youth is, a, is, a, is, a, is an important one. It, well, I guess, I, I mean, I agree with your interpretation. I think a lot of the indifference towards democracy is, uh, is located there that age group, which goes to say that, uh, well, memories of the authoritarian past are not enough to, uh, to keep democracy going. Uh, you need to deliver. And uh, I think this is, a, this is a big issue. And I guess the other, the other issue that I would like to mention is that for for a lot of for a lot of people in this age segment, issues like climate change are very important, and democracies are spectacularly poorly equipped to deal with this kind of issue. And actually, one of the crucial questions going forward globally, one of the crucial questions about democracy is how how we equip democracies to deal with intergenerational challenges, which calls, I suspect, for integrating into the political uh, debate the voice of young people, uh, which in practice uh, encounter all way of obstacles when they try to, to uh, participate in the traditional matrix of, of, of politics. And that's why they choose to do it through social media and on the street. And 
your question about, well, about Nicaragua, I, I would say that, uh, well, Daniel hasn't shut down a, a, a parliament the way Maduro did. Uh, we may have a discussion about whether it's, a, it's an effective legislature or whether it provides any kind of check on his power, but he at least has had the courtesy of not, you know, shutting down the whole thing, uh, which was not the case in Venezuela. I think that would be a tipping point. So, thank you. I want to, uh, as we conclude, I want to thank you for your attention. I want to uh, express gratitude to our speakers, uh, congratulate the International Idea for, for this release of this report, and, and thank our hosts, the International Inter-American Dialogue, uh, for making this possible. We decided to to, to participate in this event uh, and look forward to future such opportunities. So thank you all. Have a wonderful day.